And our sermon title this morning is The Anatomy of Apostasy. The Anatomy of Apostasy. And this is our third part in this series as we've been walking through this paragraph in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, where the Bible says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. This is a serious issue, this issue of apostasy, very serious in Ephesus, serious issue in Ephesus, and a very serious issue down through the ages in the professing church today. From the time of Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, there has been proven to be a tragic and horrific coupling of truths that has lasted throughout the ages. One truth, the constant presence of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. From the time the truth was established, you have Satan establishing seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. But we also at the same time see the wickedly deceitful heart of man. One, the constant presence of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons that undermine the Word of God, they undermine the truth of God, using human agents, as we've seen in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, hypocritical liars with the brand mark of Satan, a seared conscience, spreading lies with the purpose of drawing away after themselves disciples. But also at the same time, at the same time, you have the desperately wicked and deceitful above all things heart within you, Uh, your worst enemy. You have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and the worst betrayer you have in your own chest that you have to contend with, Uh, the wicked traitor in your own chest, the enemy of your soul, your heart. This is a recipe for utter disaster, and it's a consequence of the fall. From the beginning, God's word was undermined, and now this coupling of these two truths The work of Satan, the doctrines of demons, and the deceitful heart of man has provided a backdrop, if you will, for the constant and deplorable failure of man over the ages. And not just among men in general. Most insidiously here is the failure of men, and specifically professing Christians, within the professing church, those that would attest to be or claim to be God's people. Where there is truth, you have the forces of evil arrayed against it. This is a spiritual war. Timothy says, or Paul says to Timothy here earlier, that we're to wage the good warfare. We're to fight the good fight. This is warfare. But our enemy isn't wearing a different uniform. He's wearing the same uniform that you have on. (laughs) He looks similar. He disguises himself as an angel of light, as a minister of righteousness. He's in the trench with you, supposedly and enticing you to turn your weapons on your own brothers, your brothers in arms. He pretends to be a brother in arms with you. These are hypocritical liars, and they turn many away from the faith. And we're to expect that. The Spirit expressly says that it will be so. And the longer that we go, the farther we get toward that day, this will abound more and more, as the Scripture says, constantly turning people away from the faith to shipwreck. We have the story of God's people to attest to this. If we look through our Bible, and you read your Bible, you see the constant story of man's failure. You have the story of God's people, Israel, constantly turning to idolatry. Moses could barely get down the mountain before they were making a golden calf for themselves, right? Constantly given to idolatry. When they come into the land, they fail to drive out false worship, as the Lord had told them to do, and when they failed to drive them out, It's like, well, you can't beat them, join them. And so all those wicked nations drew the people into idolatry, drew them into apostasy, and they turned from God. Failure, failure, failure. Through the book of Judges, it is a repetitive pattern of sin and of judgment. And then God's great grace, His great mercy and deliverance. Despite failure after failure after failure, God still comes and delivers. And it's a repetitive failure even through the book of Judges. Finally, the Israelites, they reject God as king over them, and they request a king, a rejection of God. And then every king, it seems as though, is one failure after another. You have a couple of righteous kings, and then you read of their sons, 
They did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's just a pattern, a repetitive pattern of failure, one king after another, leading the people into idolatry. And then the Lord again, in his great grace and in his mercy, sends the prophets. One prophet after another, warning of judgment, until finally Israel finds themselves in exile. Israel constantly turning away into apostasy from the beginning until now. Apostasy has been a great concern of God for his people, of God for Old Testament Israel, of God for the church today. And it is a compilation, and these apostates, a compilation of compromises leading to a despicable departure from God and his truth. However, even within the confines of the visible apostate community of Israel, the Lord, in his grace and in his mercy again, pervert, preserves for himself a remnant. God preserves his own elect, saved by grace through faith in the Old Testament, just as believers today are saved by grace through faith, preserved them, preserving them by his grace to the saving of their souls. Now, you fast forward into the church age, right? And today we're in the church. At the same time, God saves his true, the bride of Christ. And at the same time that God saves his true, his elect, the bride of Christ, Satan sets up his false. And the false is a seductive and alluring whore. And people fall headlong after the seduction. God's truth is that which is perfect, converting the soul. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. While the doctrines of demons spouted by the whore are those by which Satan blinds the minds of those who don't believe. They are, as the Bible says, destructive heresies that bring swift destruction. They're marked by philosophy, as Paul says in Colossians, by empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And those that are not genuinely and truly wed to Christ, those that are not among the bride, will eventually run off after the seductions of the whore. Little by little, compromise by compromise, one piece at a time, drifting away. J. Gresham Machen said this, What is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires. And that is true of, think about it for a moment, the theory of evolution. And I'll imagine, if you can, the damage caused by that wicked the start of one theory and the damage caused by that wicked theory in the minds of people who will embrace that doctrine of demons and go to hell. It is a wicked, deceitful spirit. And that is Satan's purpose for the church. It is to tear down that empire. It is to tear down God's people and using hypocritical liars to do it. Paul begins in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, with a well-defined warning. He says in verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. And I think this is, analogy is helpful for us to think about. You have in the church those that we could illustrate as being live wires, so to speak. Wires with an electrical current running through them connected to a power source, which is God. That is the true current the Holy Spirit running through them, right? We analogize them to an electrical wire. That wire connected to the source, and there's a current running through it. That wire is strongly and inseparably linked, in this case, to God. They're connected to the source. But now Hebrews 6, verse 4, talks about those who are enlightened. They've tasted of the heavenly gift. They've become partakers with the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, but then they fall away. Those that fall away aren't true Christians. They're like a second wire running parallel to the true that picks up this second-hand current, if you will. They have the notions of the heavenly gift. They sense the powers of the age to come. They've been somewhat enlightened by being around the true wire connected to the true source. But because they're not connected to the source themselves, that fake power, if you will, is quickly exhausted, dies, and they fall away. It's nothing more than fake, second-hand electricity, if you will. They're not connected to the source. And so the second current has no power, and they depart from the faith. The warning here in this is for you, in verse 1. We're given a warning by Paul to Timothy here, to us. 
Are you true? Are you connected to the power source? Are you connected to God? Are you one of the true wires? Do you have the current of the Holy Spirit running through you? Or are you just a fake secondhand wire picking up on a secondhand current? What are you? If you are not connected to the source, you will fall away. And you'll eventually be judged. It's that second wire that's a hypocritical fake. The hypocritical fake. One of the tests of this is what you'll do, how you'll respond, how you'll react when one of those that you thought was a real wire connected to the source, when one of those fake hypocritical wires next to you, running parallel to you, falls away, what will you do? Will you trail off with that one and fall away just the same? Or will you remain steadfast through that and stay connected? Another is, are you simply going to obey God? Or will you give in to self-will? Will you give in to sin? Will you give in to self-indulgence? Will you give in to that seducing spirit and doctrine of demons? That well-defined warning by the Spirit in verse 1 is followed up by what we see as a dangerous devotion, point two on your notes. Verse 1 goes on to say, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Apostasy begins by giving heed. By giving heed. The soon-to-be apostate, by default, stops heeding Scripture. Stops heeding godly counselors. Stops heeding accountability. Stops heeding godly brothers and sisters who care for their soul. Stops heeding wisdom from the Word of God. Stops heeding accountability. And they start heeding their own desires, their own opinions, their own preferences, their own self-will. They start heeding the seduction of some sin or some error, some worldly reasoning. Someone in the world comes along and rises something up against the knowledge of God, and they start heeding that. We were witnessing to a young lady yesterday. Got to a point. Here is what the Word of God says, and yet here is what you ignorantly and willfully want to continue to believe. And ultimately, there's a self-will associated with apostasy. The Word of God says this, and I choose to believe this. I choose to do this simply not conforming themselves to the Word of God. It is a dangerous devotion. But all this, we're, we're to understand, is by means of, point three, by means of hellish hypocrites. In verse two, we saw speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The ultimate cause of all this is Satan. Doctrines of demons, deceiving spirits, lying spirits. However, the means of this, the proximate means of it, is human agents very natural. These are hypocritical liars. The falling away will not be because they heeded the counsel of their elders or pastors. The falling away will not be because they sought and followed the biblical counsel of godly brothers or godly sisters in the church who loved them and desire to faithfully look out for their soul. The falling away will not be because they sought to faithfully obey whatever the Bible clearly says. The falling away will not be because they labored with all long suffering to strive for peace, to work for peace. The falling away will not be because they patiently and humbly considered their actions under the spotlight of God's word. The falling away will not be because of their love for the brothers. The falling away will not be because they faithfully held their post to serve as they were called to serve. The falling away will be because of the opposite of every one of those. The falling away will be because they are wrapped in self-will and rebellion and sin, shrouded in some self-righteous excuse, stuffed in the skin of a superficial godliness, all to the tune of some hypocritical liar, some deceiving spirit leading them astray, a pawn of Satan. They twist their thinking, and while their thinking is being twisted, they sear their conscience. Peter says in 2 Peter 3.17, You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. This is a warning given throughout Scripture. We've got to heed that warning. It's a serious warning. It's not a hypothetical warning. And we've got to be very conscious of that. We need to fear God in this. As we move to verse 3 this morning, 
we see, beginning in verse 3, both the fruit of apostasy, but we also see those doctrines of demons that produce it. One example here given in Ephesus. So for this, in point four on your notes, we see a ghastly exchange. In verse 3, a ghastly exchange. Verse 3 goes on to say, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. The ghastly exchange here is this. It's exchanging the truth for a lie. It's exchanging true godliness for a wicked worldliness. It's exchanging the gospel of grace for a fake gospel of works righteousness. Ultimately, it's exchanging Christ for pagan religion, just like every other religion in the world. And this is a masterful work of Satan to do this. A masterful work of Satan, beginning in the first century as the church is being established. A masterful work of Satan throughout the ages, and a masterpiece of Satan in our day and age today. Uh, This is a masterpiece that comes from hell. And there are, in Ephesus at this time, several strains of influence that gave rise to this apostasy in the church, this difficulty. One, in Ephesus at the time, you had what they called the sect of the Essenes, the Essenes of Qumran. The Essenes of Qumran taught that it was virtuous to reject any kind of physical pleasure. So that's going to do away with marriage. It's going to do away with those foods you like. (laughs) You may eat those that you don't particularly like. But to do away or reject all pleasure even in marriage. They taught their followers that it was virtuous virtuous to neglect marriage altogether. In addition to the Essenes and what the Essenes were teaching, you had the seeds of what would become in the second century eventually a Gnosticism. The Gnosticism taught that the human body and all of the functions of the human body were evil. So to be godly, you had to live above the physical and do away with the physical, to reject the physical. It was a fake, superficial kind of spirituality that the Gnostics taught. And you had here in Ephesus the seeds of what would eventually become a full-blown Gnosticism. But also in Ephesus, you had those in Ephesus at the time that were living what we would call an over-realized eschatology. Eschatology is a study of last things. Those last things are that the kingdom is coming. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here, but the Lord will set up His kingdom and will rule and reign from Jerusalem. There is a kingdom that will be established. Those that have this over-realized view of end times would say, well, because the Lord is about to set up His kingdom we might as well go ahead and start living like we're in the kingdom now. And so those things that Jesus taught, like those angels in heaven, we're not going to be married nor given in marriage, and so we might as well not be married now. We might Let's just forsake marriage altogether. They knew that in the kingdom, it's not like we're going to be killing animals to eat meat, and so we need to stop eating meat now. We need to live now like we're in the kingdom. The problem with that is that the kingdom is not in that sense now, and that contradicts the Word of God. But they had those that were living out this over-realized eschatology. Let me give you one example of that. Just flip the page to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look down beginning in verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. Here Paul says to Timothy, But shun profane and idle babblings. For they will increase, these are profane and idle babblings that we see represented here in verse 3. They're just profane, idle babblings. They will increase to more ungodliness, verse 17. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past. In other words, there's an over-realized eschatology. And they overthrow, by teaching this, they overthrow the faith of some. They cause some to plunge into shipwreck, shipwreck their faith. Nevertheless, verse 19 says, The solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You want to boil it down, your Christian life? If you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. Here, there are those who are teaching that which they ought not, for dishonest gain, and they're leading away disciples after themselves. In addition to that, 
You have the Essenes and that heresy that was being spread. You had the seeds of a Gnosticism that was being spread. You had those that were mixed up about end times and about the kingdom of God. And you still had, in Ephesus at this time, those Jews or those coming out of Judaism who were caught up in the dietary laws, who were having real difficulty with this. If you can imagine, you remember Peter and the sheet coming down with all manner of animals in it. Right? And that sheet had to come down three times, take up Peter and eat, before Peter got the idea that those dietary laws weren't in effect any longer and that Peter could eat that food. So in this context, now think about it for a moment, the Essenes and their asceticism, the Gnostics and their asceticism, the tendency toward this kingdom mentality that was unbiblical, and then those that were still caught up in dietary laws, what does Satan do? Satan hits them where it hurts. Satan hits them where they're most vulnerable. He doesn't introduce to them a seducing spirit with the doctrine of demons of easy believism. He doesn't introduce to them antinomianism or lawlessness. You can live lawlessly and still be a Christian. He doesn't introduce to them a dead orthodoxy. Now, don't worry about obeying. What does he do? In their context, Satan, and again, a masterpiece from hell, introduces to them asceticism. Law, more law, a different law, additional man-made laws. Asceticism is an avoidance of self-indulgence for religious reasons. It's denying yourself, those things which God has said is okay, it's denying yourself those indulgences for the sake of being more religious or more spiritual or more favorable toward God. Here it was just more law that he was introducing, and that was where they were most vulnerable. The mileage that Satan has gotten out of this error is staggering. The amount of damage that he has caused is staggering. It's the avoidance of self-indulgences. Now, this avoidance here is focused primarily toward two glorious gifts from God, food and marriage, marriage and food. And here is the ghastly exchange. On this issue of marriage and food, those that followed this seductive spirit into this heresy trade their standing in Christ for foolish ascetic pursuits. They trade the freedom that they have in Christ for this yoke of bondage and this fake standard of spirituality. They depart from the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints to take on this form of self-denial, which becomes the sum of their religion. In order to be right with God, I have to deny myself certain things. In order to be right with God, I need to deny marriage, deny intimacy in marriage. Some were married, and they denied intimacy inside of their marriage, for the sake of being spiritual, some would deny the foods that they eat. Now, is this still going on today? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. In taking on that fake, false, superficial, lying, hypocritical religion, they displace Christ. The Bible clearly teaches that. Alexander McLaren wrote this. Any asceticism is a great deal more to men's taste than abandoning self. They will rather stick hooks in their backs and do the swinging puja than give up their sins and yield up their wills. Listen to this. There is only one thing that will put the collar on the neck of the animal within us, and that is the power of the indwelling Christ. Ascetic religion is godless. For its practitioners essentially worship themselves, and as such, we are not to be intimidated by it. Wherever you encounter this false religion, rebuke it. Expose it for what it is. It is a doctrine of demons. Expose it for what it is. It is a fake, hypocritical spirituality that does not save. That person is still in blindness. What contributes to this? I mean, why is it that those who are not connected to the source would go headlong after some seductive spirit like this, some doctrine of demon, rather than connecting themselves to the source. What is so seductive? One contributing factor is the nature of the apostate. Isn't it just like the apostate 
or the hypocritical liar who's teaching this nonsense to take something that is commended by God or commended by Christ and twist it and pervert it into something that is destructive. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul clearly commends singleness, right? But Paul also clearly commends marriage. And so what does the hypocritical liar do? What does that deceiving spirit through the human agent spread? He twists that to say, well, let's not be married at all. If singleness is commended, then marriage is evil. Let's do away with marriage at all. If you're already married, well, too bad for you. Do away with intimacy in marriage. In Matthew 6, Jesus Christ commends fasting under certain circumstances, under certain conditions. He commends it. So what does the hypocritical liar do? The hypocritical liar forbids certain foods all the time. He twists it into some super spiritual thing that's going to gain merit with God. He turns it into a man-made law. So you have those that believe this to their own destruction. There were those in Ephesus that preached that future kingdom living. In that sense, they were preaching that we should live otherworldly. And in preaching that we should live otherworldly, they became completely worldly themselves. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. Look at 1 Timothy. Just go back to chapter 6. Chapter 6. They are preaching that we should live otherworldly, and yet they are completely worldly themselves. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, Paul says to Timothy, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, and that's the key there, what you say, what you believe, how you think, how you feel, how you act and react, every bit of it should be submitted to the Word of God. It doesn't matter what you think yourself. It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the Word of God says. It doesn't matter how you think that somehow it's going to work out for you on Judgment Day when you stand before God and give an account for your life and you're judged according to your works. It doesn't matter a hill of beans what you think. It matters what the Word of God says. It matters what God thinks. You're coming to salvation on His terms. It doesn't matter what you believe out of your own heart to be true. It matters what the Bible says is true. And there are many who will hold on to and grasp their own feeble attempts at imagining what is true or false, and they will follow that doctrine all the way to hell. It matters what the Word of God says. And if your beliefs aren't rooted and grounded in Scripture, you're in big trouble. And we were speaking with a lady, uh, witnessing to her, my brother and I, and again, just believing what she believes. It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the Word of God says. What if your belief contradicts what the Scripture clearly says? What are you going to do with your belief? You need to drop that and submit yourself to what the Word of God says. Your belief doesn't matter. It matters what the Word of God says. We're to believe that. We're told what to believe. Here, these are wholesome words. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here, it's the doctrine in Scripture which accords with godliness. How can you tell a doctrine of demon? It doesn't accord with godliness. It accords with godlessness. It leads to error. It leads to sin. Here, this is the doctrine that accords with godliness. But he goes on to say, anyone who teaches other than that is proud, verse 4, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. Bring up the truth of God's word in opposition to someone's foolish belief, and you're going to cause contention. <laughs> There's going to be strife. Uh, bring up the truth of God in the face of someone's firmly grasped opinion or preference or belief, and you're going to see sparks fly. Verse 5, they are useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. How many godly, godless money-grubbing TV preachers have you seen who believe that the Word of God is a means to gain. It's common in our day today as well, isn't it? We see it all the time. Others, you got the nature of the apostate. Others may be trying to placate a guilty conscience. They cannot attain 
to a true level of spirituality themselves, to the true level of spirituality, to a true standard of spirituality, and so they create for themselves their own. And they do that through this, through asceticism, through all kinds of things. They can't attain to forsaking their sin because they have no spirit. They're not connected to the source. And so they settle for a man-made, a made-up, a fabricated standard of holiness, a standard of their own choosing. And they mask their own inner wickedness by an outward observance or an outward morality, an outward conformity to what they think is truth. In other words, when you, being false, not being true, when you are that hypocritical, fake, second parallel wire that doesn't have the current running through it, when you're not connected to the source, then you cannot forsake your selfishness. When you can't forsake lust, you can't forsake your greed, you can't forsake your anger, you can't forsake your pride, you can't forsake your covetousness, you can't forsake gossip, you can't forsake divisiveness, you can't forsake malice, you can't forsake murder in the heart, right? You can't forsake adultery in the heart, you can't forsake your thieving, you can't forsake anger in traffic, anger toward your spouse, anger on the job, you can't forsake your discontentedness, you can't forsake your discouragement or despair or depression, you can't forsake your sin, then you attempt to acquire righteousness by abstaining from those things that God has left you free to do, and you call it righteousness. You know what? I can't forsake all of this, so I'm going to forsake lasagna on Fridays, and that makes me holy. <laughs> I'm going to forsake, I'm going to be, I'm going to be single, but I'm lusting constantly. You can't forsake the sin, so you do something that you call holy and you make up your own righteousness. You can't forsake those things because you're not connected to God. You're not connected to the source. You're not empowered by the Spirit. You're not saved. If you are floundering in your sin, you are in a pattern of unrighteousness, a pattern of sin, a pattern of anger, a pattern of lust, a pattern of greed, a pattern of covetousness. If you're in that pattern of sin, a pattern of no interest in the things of God, a pattern of indifference, a pattern of apathy, a pattern of no hungering and thirsting for righteousness, a pattern where you just sort of go through the motions, a pattern of enjoying your sin, not loving Christ, and you're lost. The Lord has not changed your heart. You're not connected to the source. You're not indwelt by the Spirit. The Lord has to change who you are from the inside out. And if you haven't turned from your sin and put your faith and trust in Christ alone to save you, You've not submitted to the Lordship of Christ. You've not sold out for Christ because of all He's done to save you. If you've not turned from your sin and put your faith in Christ, then you're hopelessly lost. You're hopelessly lost to stand before God one day in your own righteousness. And all of that effort on your part to establish a fake, hypocritical righteousness that is made up is going to be good for nothing. It won't fly on Judgment Day. It's not going to last one second Lord is going to see you for the hypocrite that you are, and you're going to spend eternity in hell paying for your own sin. Flee to Christ. When you flee to Christ, God will change your heart. When you flee to Christ, God will empower you with His indwelling Holy Spirit. When you flee to Christ, the Lord will credit the perfect righteousness, the perfect obedience of Christ to your account, and He will connect you forever as a child of the kingdom to the source of life, which is God Himself. And He'll empower you to live the Christian life. He'll empower you to over overcome covetousness and greed and anger and sin. He saves us from sin. You've got to be connected to the source. This is wicked self-righteousness, wicked, hypocritical, fake, fabricated righteousness. This is not the righteousness of Christ. And remember, no matter how nice, no matter how humble, how self-effacing, how friendly these people are, they are hypocritical liars and pawns of Satan, pawns of deceiving spirits spreading doctrines of demons. They propagate a false spirituality. They call it real, and they're acting in accord with 
Satan. But secondly, another contributing factor here is the nature of satanic attacks against the gospel. Satan has as his purpose to attack the gospel, that which saves. All false religion, all false religion, those doctrines of demons, all false religion is made up, is devising human means by which people are saved. The one true gospel, the one thing that is true, that we can take to the bank, that we can believe in wholeheartedly because God is true, God does not lie, the one thing that is true is Christ's gospel. That by grace, and grace alone, through faith and faith alone, in the person and finished work of Christ, and Christ alone, may we be saved. And there is no work of righteousness that you can do. You can't help enough old ladies cross the street. You can't take out your neighbor's garbage frequently enough to make up for all the sin that you've committed. You can't do anything to save yourself. You can't do anything to roll off the offense that you personally have caused before a holy God that created you. You can do nothing. The only true religion that there is is a religion of God did it all and saved my wretched soul. All wicked false religion. All hypocritical, lying doctrines of demons, all of that made by seducing spirits, spread, propagated by seducing spirits, is all human achievement. Is all human achievement. What men devise for themselves in order to save themselves, in order to placate a guilty conscience, in order to self justify. And I'm telling you, you talk to just a few people, you witness for any length of time how doggedly and persistently people clutch to that lie. It's the lie in this life that gives them comfort. It will be the lie in the next life that causes them to burn. And this here, this asceticism is just a, an example of that. It communicates a false spirituality, a false means of attaining holiness. And this is something that is so clearly, so repeatedly taught in Scripture. To believe it really is staggeringly ignorant because it's taught so clearly in the Word of God. Paul, in Romans 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul, obviously, as we said, commends marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Listen to Mark in chapter 7, verses 14 to 19. When Jesus Christ had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. Okay, we're going to preface this statement with a Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, saying, hear me and understand this. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him. Can that be said any clearer? No. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> Pretty clear. In other words, the dietary laws are gone. There's nothing that goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him, what comes out of your heart, through your mind, out of your lips, into your actions. That's what defiles you before God. And outside of Christ, you are a constant defilement. Inside of Christ, you can't do anything righteous on your own. All of your righteousness is because of Christ. All of the good that you do is as a result of the Holy Spirit at work in you. He goes on to say in verse 17, when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but it enters his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Has this error of asceticism gone away? Or is Satan still getting mileage out of this today? No, he's still getting mileage out of this today. The Scripture can't be... Let me give you another example. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Scripture cannot be any clearer. In Colossians chapter 2, look beginning in verse 16. Here Paul says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. In other words, do not sacrifice freedom in Christ for man-made rules. 
Don't substitute freedom in Christ for man-made rules. The shadow is the thing that is no, isn't real. It has no reality. The reality is Christ. The shadow simply points to the thing that is real. The reality here is Christ. Don't substitute freedom in Christ for man-made rules. Here it says, um, verse 18, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up. This is a result of pride. Puffed up. You get, you know, I fasted three days this week. <laughs> you know, it's like, are you kidding me? False humility, worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom, it's a capital H there, that's Christ, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty that we have in Christ, um, by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. But despite that, despite how clear it is in Scripture, look for a moment at what Satan has accomplished through this exchange. One, he has them in Ephesus believing that holiness comes through asceticism. That is a wicked lie. The holiness comes through asceticism. Holiness only comes through faith in Christ by the work of the Spirit of God. Two, they are actually practicing this, and they're doing it with zeal. You have leaders in the church that are practicing this and teaching this. Look at what Satan has accomplished here, this masterpiece from the pit of hell. Three, he's managed to separate professing Christians from God. They're those who are falling away, and they're falling away from God, who is true, and the righteousness that is theirs by faith in Christ, and they're turning away to this stupid, ignorant asceticism. They're falling away from God. Four, they place their own supposed spirituality in a, in a position that goes beyond what God has said is spirituality. In other words, it's almost like Eve in the garden. God said, do not eat of the fruit of this tree. Eve told the serpent, we're not to eat it, nor are we to touch it. <laughs> Going beyond the command of God. This, these man-made rules, this asceticism, going beyond the command of God, in some sense that this is some hyper-spirituality, and it's just a lie. It's going to send them to hell. Verse 5, it separates Christians from one another. It creates a two-tier Christianity, if you will. You've got those elite who can do without marriage and without eating meat, but us mere mortals... <laughs> we got to eat meat and get married, <laughs> right? So, it, you know, you can't handle the heat. Oh, you're going to be a second-class Christian. Go ahead and eat your meat. <laughs> Creates two classes of Christians. Six, it separates the whole assembly from those outside in terms of the gospel. In other words, there is no longer any heart transformation associated with the gospel. It's just a list of do's and don'ts like every other wicked religion in the world. In other words, it strips the miraculous power of God out of the gospel. You don't have to have that life-changing transformation to give evidence that you are of God or have been born again. The gospel is no more than another list of do's and don'ts, just like every other world religion is just another list of do's and don'ts. In other words, you can live, the pagan would say, you live just like me. You live just like me. You look no different than me. You do the same kinds of things that I do to be spiritual. And so we're just spiritual together. Uh, wicked, false separation here. Satan has got a lot of mileage out of this. We can't make barriers that God has not made. Ultimately, it is demonic. The mileage is still being continued today. The Catholic Church continues to forbid marriage and forbid food. You know, it was said at one point, the Catholic Church put into their teaching so many days of the year that a man and woman in marriage could not be intimate that eventually it encompassed half the year. No wonder there was a reformation. <laughs> half the year. 
It's wicked. Is it, it is an asceticism. You have St. Simeon Stylites, the elder, who sat 37 years on the top of a pole because it was spiritual. You have nuns throughout history that have encased themselves and closed themselves in cathedral walls because their isolation was spiritual, being fed through little holes, you know, stuffing stuff through little holes to feed them. Ridiculous. The, the moral to take away from this is they cannot attain to the truth, and so they create for themselves a falsehood. What about you? Have you attained to the truth? The only way that you will is to turn from your sin and trust Christ. The only way that you will is to place your reliance, trust, faith in Him alone. Cry out to God, who is the source of salvation, and plead with Him to change your heart, change your nature, change your mind, and put you on the right path. Cry out to God for salvation. Instead of blindly accepting that which is false as a substitute for that which is true. You'll stand there one day with your substitute little fake truth and you'll be dropped into hell. The answer to apostasy here is given, us, given to us in verse 3 and in verse 4 and 5 here. It goes on to say, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Here in Ephesus, asceticism is an example. It's an example of what those that fell away were being led away by, what those that fell away were producing. But you can substitute that example in our day and age today, apply it principally to our situation with just about any heresy that we've got. Easy believism, the grace of God into licentiousness, dead orthodoxy, baptismal regeneration. I'm going to walk this little eye. I'm going to say this silly little prayer. I'm going to go out and live like I want to live and call myself a Christian. Whatever heresy being taught today, you want to substitute for asceticism, you can. It is the same thing. It is a lie that is substituting for the truth. And here the Lord says about this, that there, in these two verses here, four and five specifically, there are basically six statements that makes up Paul's argument for us to avoid apostasy, to avert apostasy. One, God created food good. He created it good. Secondly, Prayer of thanksgiving, gratefulness to God, is what affirms it as good, confirms its goodness. It says in verse 3 that God created it to be received with thanksgiving. In other words, He created it good. In verse 4, every creature of God is good. Verse 5, it is sanctified or separated by the word of God in prayer. It is separated to be good. But then notice the second part of the argument, that it is thankfulness that confirms its goodness. In verse 3, it is to be received with thanksgiving. We receive it with grateful hearts to the Lord. In verse 4, nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Verse 5, it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer, that prayer of gratefulness to God. Here, notice that the food isn't good because of the prayer. When you sit down in, at the table to eat and you say your blessing, the food isn't good or isn't acceptable or isn't okay because you prayed over it. It was already good. It was created good. But what the prayer does, what the thankful heart does, is put that in its proper perspective, is that it comes from God, who created it good, who gives it to you as a loving Heavenly Father that supplies everything that you need. It affirms and confirms its goodness as coming from God. And the prayer puts that in the right response. Look at, uh, notice in verse 4, nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. That's a conditional word there. And this is the point, I think, from that. God designed food. Designed food so that His people could express their thankfulness, their gratefulness to Him through this. The Lord gave food for our good. Gave food to supply our need. And in turn, we are to receive that as from God's gracious hand as good and as from Him. It is to be received with gratefulness. Romans 1 says of the apostates, says of the pagan, that they weren't thankful, they weren't grateful. Here, Christians are thankful to God for supplying their needs. It's an interesting connection here. So the antidote to averting apostasy here, given in 3, 4, and 5, is certainly that we can receive these things and do these things because we have freedom in Christ to do it, but that reception is with a grateful heart, 
is with thanksgiving to God. Very quickly, another way to avert apostasy, Jeremiah 32, verse 40 says, the fear of God. God says, I'll make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. We're to take these warnings very seriously. A third and final way to avoid apostasy is the perseverance of the saints. Maybe a more appropriate way of saying that is the preservation of the saints by God. We must fight. We must wage the good warfare to persevere in the faith to be saved. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, to judgment, to condemnation. But we are those that press on in believing to the saving of our souls. We're to persevere to the end and be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You go off. You come into the church. You say, I want to follow Christ. I want to flee the wrath of God. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to be forgiven of all this sin. And so you come into the church and you start what is supposedly your Christian life. And then you start drifting, start trailing off into this error, into this sin, start trailing off into self-will, start drifting away from the truth that we have from God's word, the truth that we have in Christ. All of your belief, all of your effort, all of your hypocritical self-righteousness, all of that belief, all of those opinions, all those preferences, all that sin, all of it is in complete vain. You will not attain to that which you seek. And in hypocrisy, you on judgment day will be revealed as a liar. Hold fast to that which is true. Run hard after that which is right. Run hard after Christ. Cling to the cross. He's done it all. He's done it all. Just abandon yourself for him. Give up living for yourself. Give up that wicked lifestyle. Turn to Christ and serve him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the Lord Jesus Christ will give you his perfect righteousness. He'll take that penalty that you deserve. And he took it on his own body on the tree so that you might have heaven, that you might have God as your inheritance, that you might have Christ for all eternity. Is that a glorious promise? Why would we ever go after the fake? Why would we go after the counterfeit? Seek hard after Christ and persevere to the end and be saved. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, God, we pray to you in great need. We pray to you acknowledging our great need. We need help in this, Lord. Our hearts, which are desperately wicked, deceitful above all things, Lord, are so susceptible to being drawn away after some trinket of deceiving spirits, some wicked lie. And those temptations are often alluring. God, they're often tempting because they feed our flesh, they feed our self-will, they feed our pride. Lord, help us to stand fast against those wiles of the wicked one. Lord, help us to stand fast in the freedom that we have in Christ. Help us to stand fast, Lord, clinging to the cross and persevering to the end to be saved. Protect your church, Lord, from those wicked, seducing spirits. God, protect your church from doctrinal error. That, Lord, grant us faithfulness to the doctrine that accords with godliness. Lord, grant your church faithful brothers and sisters that look out for one another. Lord, that we might together persevere to the end and be saved. We pray all this, Lord, for the good of your people, but certainly, God, for your glory, for your name's sake. You have saved a people to be your own treasured possession, zealous for good works. Lord, and so for your name, for the greatness of your name, that your name might still among this wicked and pagan generation in which we live, God, that your ma name might still be made famous, that you might be seen as holy and just and righteous and good, and yes, Lord, as merciful, and as loving, and as forgiving. We love you, and we praise you, Lord. We want to see you worshiped in this. We, Lord, one day unfettered by sin, want to worship you as you are worthy to be worshiped. 
We love you, Lord, and thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for this paragraph of Scripture that you've been so gracious to allow us to study together. And I pray, Lord, that you would, by your Spirit, deeply apply this to our hearts, that we might live in a healthy fear of you, we might live in a healthy understanding of our own weakness, Lord, and that we might cling to you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.